Father Lord, we commit our time in your presence into your hands. We ask that you do a new thing, O God. Speak to our hearts. Strengthen us. Get us ready. Let your name be glorified. Thank you, God of heaven. In Jesus' mighty name we have prayed. Hallelujah. Good afternoon. Please be seated. God bless you. Um, if you're joining us online, um, welcome. This is the Well Oasis International. This is meant to be our empowerment service, but we tweaked things. Um, we don't have an empowerment service today, but we have a second service coming, which will be our communion service. And Pastor Mark will take that service. But this service is the main service, so I'm going to continue with Treasures of Darkness, part number four. But before that, I want to introduce to you the book for the next... Um, round of empowerment services we'll be having. It is still the same author, John C. Maxwell, and we're going to be um, reviewing the book, Everyone Communicates, Few Connect. Everyone communicates, few connect. If you know anything about the race that is called Christian, we're people who have been called by God to go and make disciples. So it is essential that we learn the art of communication. Amen. But quickly to the subject matter at hand, the subject matter of the treasures of darkness, part number four. Last week, we, in, in the series, we looked at the theme that all may know. Because it was Easter Sunday, we did our best to tie it to Easter and the work and the sacrifice at the cross that Jesus had to make so that the world may know, so that we can be reconciled to the Father, and so that men and women, the world over, would know that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. We saw that on the journey, even we must be willing to be processed through darkness, so that when we come out on the other side, we are, we, when we come out on the other side, we our testimonies to the goodness of God. Hallelujah. Today, um, our subject matter, like I said, is treasures of darkness, but our theme is the submarine. The submarine. Hallelujah. The submarine. Hallelujah. Now, if you know what the submarine is, I'm sure you've seen it in movies before, even if you haven't seen one life. I haven't seen one live, but I have seen it in movies. Um, not that I watch a lot of those movies, but I know what a submarine looks like. But the dictionary says that a submarine is um, a vessel that can be submerged and navigated underwater, usually built for warfare. A submarine is a vessel that can be submerged and nav navigated underwater, usually built for warfare. Submarines exist and are used underwater. What that means, therefore, is that a, the submarine is not a cruise ship. Hallelujah. Many years ago, someone, uh, not many years ago, if, maybe a couple of years ago, someone had a dream, and she related the dream to me. It had to do with me. I was on a cruise ship um, with some influential people, she said, and um, all of a sudden, water started to enter the, the cruise ship. And um, while it, was, it, had, it became worrisome, the thing that happened was that she saw me step out of the cruise ship into a submarine. And when I asked people what it meant, many of them said to me, oh, I ought to pray really hard that um, something bad will not happen, happen to me when I'm on display and then I have to be enmeshed in water. But I have a different understanding that the submarine is a vessel for battle hallelujah and so it's not the same as the cruise ship what you need to know about a submarine is that the technology with which the submarine is made is different from the uh, um, the, the technology that the cruise ship is manufactured hallelujah i know the cruise ship is for display because this morning i actually did a little exercise i went to google and i said images of people in a submarine and then I did another um, bar, and I said images of people on a cruise ship. 
And of course, it was different. The images of the cruise ship were colorful. They were massive. They were really nice. People were gaily dressed. They were dressed relaxed, but they looked their best. Hallelujah. You know that when I don't care, but I really care kind of dressing. Even if they were wearing shorts, they were really nice shorts. Because I mean, think about it. It's not cheap to go on a cruise. Do you understand this? It's for some people, it's the dream of a lifetime. It's a bucket list um, 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 experience to be able to go on a cruise ship. I haven't been able to go to one yet. So maybe that's why I'm beefing cruise ship people today. But really, I'm not beefing them. I know that cruise ships are for enjoyment, yes? And then I looked at the images of people in the submarine. What I saw was that everyone in the submarine was kitted. It was kitted differently. I didn't see exciting colors on the sub submarine. It was khaki. It was fatigues. It was, gear, it was for people who were dressed and kitted for war. Hallelujah. And when we begin to talk about the treasures of darkness, and we're talking about the submarine, we're looking at when God takes us through darkness like the submarine. The thing you need to know about the submarine is it can be in our waters and we won't know from the surface. And yet from that place inside the water, it can tell what's happening within the vicinity. And for all we know, they are actually coming for us, but because they are underwater, we can't see them. Hallelujah. So I have scrolled on social media and I'm yet to see someone who took a picture and said, today I'm going into the submarine. We don't see people boast for those things. But when you're on a cruise ship, I must know that you've been on a cruise ship. Because it speaks to the fact that you have arrived. It speaks to the fact that you know how to enjoy life. And that's a good thing. Until God forbid you are hit. Hallelujah. And no, I'm not saying that, I would, that cruises are not good. That's not the conversation. I'm trying to draw you a comparison. So that you understand that the submarine is rugged. The submarine is... You know, even the color is grayish, dark is something that can blend underwater. Hallelujah. Because the rule of the submarine is stealth. That is no noise, nobody, no arrival, nobody needs to know that you are here. And most times when you see those um, specialist mercenary movies, it's a submarine that comes and you see them coming out of water and they go and they finish something in a whole nation and they come back and they would have arrived back at their nation before those in the nation would even wake up and realize that, ah, Kasala has happened. Something has happened. But because it was not noise, nobody knows. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I said to myself, Lord, is it possible that there is something called a submarine? Is, do you take us through submarine experiences? And the first thing that occurred to me was, oh, yes, I know that there was a time in my life that God said to me, embrace obscurity. And it was a big deal for me because mine, I wanted the billboards. I want the limelight. I do not want to be obscure by any stretch of imagination. But it was a journey I had to go through, and I believe I'm still going through even in this time. The truth is that life in God is not set up to be cruise ship moments only. Of course, there are moments where everyone would come celebrate with us when we begin to scream, see what the Lord has done. Hallelujah. But because we are also members of the soul, or we are also soldiers of the Lord's army, there are long moments and sometimes endless moments it will seem to us where we are the submarine. We are just as sturdy. We are just as dependable. We are just as skilled and, requi and required. But the thing is that we can't be seen on the surface. Hallelujah. And we don't like those moments. I don't like them. I don't think you would too. You like the submarine moments? Well, I don't, I don't, I can't stand here and lie. I really, really, really would like the cruise ship moments all my life. I'd like the billboards. I like the neon lights. I mean, waiting do light. But it's not for me to say. So life in God, unfortunately, is not set up to be cruise ship moments all the way. Life comes with submarine moments too. How we do and what instructions we heed in those times can alter the course of our lives forever. And we have to be ready and we have to prepare. Hallelujah. 
While all we, cra- all of, we all crave cruise ship moments, except Sister Shola, it is my prayer that God brings us to them. And it is my prayer that God brings us to cruise ship moments. There is no gainsaying or underst- understating the power of a submarine moment. A submarine moment that is stewarded right com- can- cannot be... Um, Ten cruise ship moments cannot be crammed into one submarine moment that is stewarded properly. Hallelujah. And someone say, is, is she even talking Bible? Go with me to Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29. I know the only verse you know in Jeremiah 29 is all, is how, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. Thoughts of good, not of evil. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know we enjoy that one. But if you knew the middle of what, of the conversation that was being had, that God started to say, I know the thoughts that I had towards you, you will not quote that scripture again. And today I want to show you that that was a scripture that was released to the, to the Jewish nation in their submarine moment. It wasn't any, it wasn't fans, it wasn't cruise ship moment that made God say that. God had them in what you call a gridlock. Do you understand it? It was, it choked them. And they were screaming, I won't die. God said, don't worry. The thoughts that I have towards you, they are of good, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope and to bring you to an expected end. So when you begin to quote it and say, I, Father, I, I know, be very careful what you are praying. I'm just saying. Jeremiah 29, I'll read from verse 1 to verse 14, and then we will break it down from there. Hallelujah. Jeremiah 29. Jeremiah 29 from verse 14, verse 1 to 14. It says, now these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders in exile, and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Who was the letter sent to? Eh? It was a letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent to who? The captives, the exile, elders in exile, to the priests, to the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had in where? In captive had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. Please, let's look at the people again. There were priests amongst them. Who can see it in his Bible? They had prophets. Can you see that? Eh? And then they had people. They had elders. Verse number two, it says, and this was after King Jeconiah also caught Konia and Joachim and the queen mother, the eunuchs and the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had, dis, uh, had departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elasa, son of Shaphan, and Gemariah, son of Hekai, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. It said, this is what the letter said, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the captives whom I have caused to be carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. To who? All the captives that were caused by who? By God to be carried from Jerusalem to where? To Babylon as what? Exiles or captives. Verse number five says, build yourselves houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens. And eat the fruit of them. Where were these people? They were in the submarine. And God said to them, Build yourselves what? Houses. And dwell in them. Plant gardens. And eat the fruit of them. Take wives. And have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not be what? Diminished. 
I don't get it. You cause them to carry me to exile. You know, an ex submarine moments are temporal moments. And if you are in captivity, all you want is to be released so that you can go back home. And this is God sending a message to them. This is not a man telling them to relax. This is God sending them a message. I know I sent them to carry you into captivity. But while you are there, well, the first thing I want you to do is buy land, build house. In exile. I'm sure many of us had never seen this scripture like this before. He said, build houses and dwell in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit thereof. So let's assume that, okay, I mean, I have to stay in, in shel half shelter. So if he tells me to build a house, it's no big deal. Do you understand that? I have to eat. So if he tells me to plant a garden, it makes sense. But what sense does verse 6 say, make? He says, take wives. Have sons and daughters. He didn't just say take wives. He gave them a mandate. He said, by those wives, make sure you have children. And then if your children are of age, marry them off if they are ladies and marry wives for your sons. And tell them that they should have children too. While you are in that place, Make sure you multiply. That's what the Bible says to me. It says, multiply dear and do not be diminished. Verse 7 says, and seek, <coughs> inquire for, and request the peace and welfare of the city to which I have caused you to be carried away captive. And pray to the Lord for it. <laughs> for in the welfare of the city in which you live, you will have welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, let not your false prophets pay attention to me and your diviners who are in your midst deceive you. Pay no attention and attach no attention and attach no significance to your dreams which you dream or to theirs. <laughs> wow God said do not mind the false prophets in your midst do not listen to the diviners the ones that say they know the future because what usually happens when we find ourselves in submarine moments is people tell us that everything will be alright is what we should be told but God was saying to the Jews, he said, don't pay attention to those people that will come and say, it will soon be over. Don't listen to them. They are false prophets. He said to them, he said, do not pay attention to the dreams that you dream. You know those dreams that you find yourself, you were tied up, and then all of a sudden, one fire came, and the ropes went, and the chains were burnt off. <coughs> and you jumped up and you zero, know, and all of a sudden you are now in Jerusalem. God said, if you dream that dream, don't pay attention to it. <laughs> he said, for they prophesy falsely to you in my name. I have not sent them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and keep my promise to you, causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts and plans that I have for you, says the Lord. Thoughts and plans for welfare and peace and not for evil, to give you hope in your final outcome. Then you will call upon me and you will hear me and you will come and pray to me, and I will hear and heed you. Then you will seek me, inquire for, and require me as a vital necessity, and find me when you search for me with all your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will release you from captivity and gather you from all the nations and all the places to which I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I caused you to be carried away captive. 
Hallelujah. And essentially God said, oh, let me back up. When we read this scripture, and we hone in, especially on verse 11, we mostly look sight of the fact and the reality of that day that there, this was a message for God's children who were in captivity. Because of bad choices or decisions, God had allowed them to be carried into captivity. And while they were in captivity, moments when their sense of identity had been eroded and they had no idea what sh they should be doing, God sent the prophet Jeremiah to them. He sent them a message on what their attitude should be. For those of us who think that the Temila day I'm talking to you, that the results or that the way out of the maze that we are in in Nigeria is to get angry with the people who are ruling us. I'm talking to you. All of you go on social media and you post nonsense. Forgetting that you were a believer and yet God left you here. Talking to you. <laughs> and you have not bothered to sit down and say, God, why am I still here? Even gardeners are jackpying. What's doing me? Why am I here? I'm the believer. The sinners are going because you know we know the sinners, yes. Why am I still here? If you did, maybe God would have shown you your own version of Jeremiah 29. You would be able to just relax. God sent this message to his people. He sent them a message and, and this message is not so much about you are in prison or you are in captivity. That is no longer news. This message was why you are in captivity. Live life like you are the freest of men. He said build houses. You know that no matter who, what you do, if you are a slave and you get a plot of land, you know that if you build, it does not belong to you, right? Yet God said build. He said marry. He said in that land, multiply. Do not remain small simply because you are in captivity. Because it would mean that you don't understand that everything that has a beginning has an end. It would mean that you do not understand that even if you make your bed in hell, I'll be there with you. If we begin to break it down from verse number 5, essentially he said in verse 5, he said, build houses, dwell in them, plant gardens, eat the fruit of them. Essentially, do not suspend living just because you have been submerged in another land, another culture, and another people. Instead, hold on to who you are. Carry on life like you are alive because you are. In verse number 6, he says, marry. Have children. Marry for your children. Give your daughters out in marriage. And make sure you tell them that they too should have children. The strength of a nation is her young people. Even in captivity, God said to them, marry, give your daughters out. Number one, that they may bear sons and daughters. Number two, that they may multiply there. Number three, that they may not be diminished. What I find is when people find themselves in submarine moments, they get angry with everybody around them. Everyone else becomes their enemy. Their mother-in-laws and their sisters-in-law and their friends become the ones that are doing them. The moment something is out of sync or out of work and you claim to be a believer, you are looking for the witch that is doing you. And God says, no matter where you find yourself, you must behave like you know that I'm in charge. 
It's the reason why if I'm well, I'll be here. If I'm sick, I'll be here. Because until I'm dead and I can't breathe anymore, I am alive. I am still a terror to the kingdom of darkness. Do you understand that? God said to them in verse number 7, He says, seek, inquire for, require, and request the peace and the welfare of the city. My brothers and my sisters, we need to recognize that the devil has nothing on us. Yes, we have an adversary, the devil. I know that. But the devil can only go as far in my life today as God will let him. And if you don't understand that, then I don't know why you are at the well. If he's able to take two minutes over me, if he's able to afflict anything in me, it is because God decided to take me through another submarine moment. Do you understand this conversation? So God said to them, he said, when you find yourself in captivity, don't begin to cause Babylon. Because Babylon did you nothing. Babylon did exactly what I wanted Babylon to do. Don't get angry. He says, because even though you are in captivity, recognize that the peace and the welfare of that land is how you will find peace and welfare in that season of your life. So when you finish cursing our leaders and calling them names, Whatever decision they make tomorrow is what you called forth. Let's go with it. Because in the end, my brothers and my sisters, God knows the end of a thing from the beginning. And if this is where we are today, it is exactly where we need to be. Someone will say that woman, she's always preaching the gospel of resignation. And my thing will be to say to you, if you knew God, you know that the only thing you can do in God is resign yourself to his hands. Anything else is going above your pay grade. I'm not saying we can't pray. Of course we pray. But I'm saying a bad attitude Simply because we find ourselves submerged. It's not how God wants us to go. That's what I'm saying. So in verse 7, he said, make sure that you seek the good of where you are at. Even if you were a prisoner there. What he was saying essentially, pay attention to me, is make sure you make valid, positive contributions right where you are. No depression right where you are. No isolation right where you are. No animosity right where you are. you are. Brethren, regardless of where we are, as long as we had been given our lives, we had given our lives to Jesus, we can continue to be good humans. In prison, you can continue to be a good person. Even though you were wrongfully jailed. <laughs> Working in an office where they are oppressive, you can continue to be a good person. Because to sink to their level is not to know who you are. We can continue to be good humans and contribute positively. We must not allow what we face to distort who we are. We must not allow what we go through to distort our self-image. You are not what you face in this season. God loves you more than that. In verse 8, he said to them, he said, What you need and indeed you require in this time is not prophecies about how fast you are going to come out of this. What you need is to build in you is the capacity to embrace God in the fullness, in his fullness, even if 70 years must pass before you make it out. Make every day count for God. 
Then in verse 10 to 11, he says, did God, God, he said, God did not forget you. Because even in the submerged vessel that is the submarine, there is a plan. How many of us know that when they take those specialists or those special ops people and they put them in the, in the submarine to go from one part of the, of the world to another, to go and intervene in some political thing or something. How many of us know that they are expected to come back home? So even though they will be submerged under that water in that ugly thing for many, 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 many months, sometimes a few days, sometimes for some months, the one thing that their nation has promised them is that they are coming home. And you guess what happens when they come home? They are heroes. So God did not forget us. There is a plan. Most importantly, the plan is a good plan. The plan is peaceful. The plan is not evil. The plan will bring us to renewed hope. There is a future embedded in the plan, even in the submarine. Then after when you have seen the plan, and if you understand and you have this right attitude, the Lord says, then you will call upon me and you will come and pray to me and I will hear and I will heed you. When the process is, processing is done, I will answer. Verse 13 says, then you will seek me and you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. Apparently, this season has, tends to turn a man's heart to God. This season tends to turn a man's eyes to be focused on God. And he said, when you get in that place and you begin to look for me and you begin to seek me with all your heart, he said, you will call upon me. And I will hear you. And I will answer. Hallelujah. It says, I will be found by you. And I will release you from captivity. And gather you from all the nations and all the places to which I have driven you, says the Lord. I will bring you back, was what he said. At the end, the plan culminates in your restoration and promotion yet in that time while in darkness you must live as a light that affects those who held you in captivity someone did not hear me i said even though you are submerged and there were people for instance that you have been you that have oppressed you to the place where you become submerged the Lord says the attitude we must adopt or adapt is that one, my brothers and sisters, that makes those ones around us see the light of God in us. Because remember that God created the darkness. If he brought us into the darkness, brethren, there must be something that we have. I don't think that America just goes on the streets and picks just about anybody. And throws them in the submarine. Even the one that is supposed to be preparing the meals. Better be special ops. Is that not the case? If there was one example I can use. To describe this to you. This is a short message. I will use Joseph. Joseph will be my main example. But I know that sometimes it is too tall an order to use Joseph as an example. Because I've studied Joseph many times. And I have something against Joseph. He's too perfect. He's not like me in many ways. If there was any comma we saw in Joseph, it was, we could even chalk it to youthful exuberance. When he said to his brothers, do you know what I dreamt? That was the only thing. After that, Joseph was just a 10 every single... Why? So may I have a problem with Joseph? That's the thing I have against him. However, let's look at Joseph. Let's even take that thing he said to his brothers and his father where he had a dream and he had to tell them, do you know that I dreamt and we were in the field and we're tying up our sheaves and all your sheaves were bound over to me. You know, and let's use that as the main thing that was Joseph's problem. 
Let's say because of that, because God knew that he was going to become the prime minister, he had to be really humbled. So let's say Joseph had pride because, I mean, I'm look, desperately looking for something to pin on Joseph. So because he was proudful, number one, he was sold into slavery. That's where we started from, yes? Even where he walked in favor, even there he walked in the favor of Potiphar. This brother said, let's throw him in the pit. Then they changed their minds. They said, we'll kill him. Then they changed their minds and said, let's not kill him. Let's sell him. So they sold him. Every step that Joseph made the moment he left his father's house was further down a submarine hole. So they sold him into slavery. What that presumed was that, or presupposed was that they would not know where to find him. You know that, right? Because they had sold him. But he landed in Egypt and he landed in Potiphar's house. Potiphar, because of the way he walked, remember I said that it didn't matter where God sent us to as, sub as submarines or where, what submarine he puts us in. I said everyone around us must see the light of Jesus in us. Do you remember? So why Joseph was in Potiphar's house, Potiphar could see the light. The only way that Potiphar could describe Joseph was the fact that God was with Joseph. So Potiphar said, if I have one who God is with, why do I need to be looking at anything? He handed everything to Potiphar except his wife. Even that wife said, I want to join everything you gave to Potiphar. Fa. You gave to Joseph. Joseph said, but your, my master did not do anything to me. On top of that, if I do this thing, I sin first against God before my master. I can't be caught doing this. Of course, the wife um, cooked up a story. You know the, the, the account. And before we knew what was happening, what happened? Joseph was thrown in prison. In prison, he shone his light again. Before we knew what was happening, the Lord or the uh, leader of the prisons or the one, the, uh, one who was in charge, the commander of the prisons, saw the light of God in Joseph again. Moved him and said, okay, help me to take after, look after these prisoners. But even while he was doing the big task, because he is who he is, and he read his own Jeremiah 29 properly. Even there, he was doing what needed to be done. He cultivated relationships. He was friends with people to the extent that he could tell when someone would wake up on a certain day and be sad from their countenance, not because they told him anything. And he told, called them, he said, something is wrong today, you are not your usual self. And they said, oh, we both had dreams and the dream is, they sounded similar and they are bothering us. He said, share my dream, your dream with me. They shared the dream. He gave them an interpretation. Exactly as he said, it came to pass. Of course, he has said, when you go out there, he said to the one that was going to go out, he said, when you get there, remember me. He got there. Promptly, he forgot. Three years later, there about, the Pharaoh dreamt. So Pharaoh, Pharaoh's dream was just as confusing as the one that the, um, the butler had. He couldn't remember, he couldn't, nobody could just decode the dream. And when Pharaoh was getting antsy and agitated, the butler remembered and said, there was someone when I dreamt, and the baker dreamt in the prison, who told us what the dream meant. And exactly as he said is how he came. Let's call that one. Maybe he'll be able to help the, the Pharaoh. So they brought Joseph. I saw something that we just read and we go on. That before Joseph would go before Pharaoh, Joseph went and shaved. Cut his hair. Changed his clothes. Somebody will say, oh, that's just honor. It's not just honor. It, it was culturally correct. Because the Israelite, the Egyptians did not keep beds. The Israelites kept beds. The Jews kept beds. And so for him to come before the king or with Pharaoh with a bed on was disrespectful. He didn't say, but I'm going to go back into prison tomorrow. So why is it? Because he didn't know what was ahead of him. Why would I bother to clean myself up? For people who threw me in jail for no reason. Because how many of us know that he made it into that Egyptian jail? Not because he did anything. 
But he put himself together. Because your light must shine. He showed up there. And then he said to the king, or he said to Pharaoh, he said, God is the one that gives interpretations. So I will ask him to give me an interpretation. Even before Joseph started, he had ascribed it all to God already. And because he did, of course, God gave him the interpretation. And he brought the interpretation to Pharaoh. But because he had read his own Jeremiah 29, he knew that he must live like he's alive because he was alive. So beyond telling Pharaoh, this is what the dream is about, he said to Pharaoh, I have an idea that will help you make sense of these seasons that are coming. I need you to look for a man that you can trust. And here is the template. If the man will follow this template, he will not, you will not lose anything. Gosh. I would not dare to give them a solution. Because I'm still upset that I did nothing to Potiphar's wife and I was thrown in jail. It didn't matter how long I had been there. But he told Pharaoh and he wasn't trying to negotiate his way out of prison. Check your Bible. He wasn't, this time, he didn't even say, Pharaoh, well, after the seven years or the 14 years, remember me. He just wanted to make a valid, positive contribution. He wanted to leave his footprints in a place that the said light could not shine. <coughs> and in shining that light, Pharaoh saw him different from how his brother saw him. Pharaoh saw what God saw from the beginning. Pharaoh said, oh, okay. Here's what's going to happen. There is nobody else who can run the agenda that you have distilled. So you come, be number two in Egypt, and run this agenda for the next 14 years. And not only does something change, for Joseph, in that instant, he became the beacon of hope for his father and his brothers and the entire Jewish people that could have perished in those seven years of famine. This was exactly where God was going. Because as early as Genesis 15 verse 13... God had said to Abraham that you see these people will be, your people, your descendants will be carried into captivity. He had been set. What God did not tell Abraham, God, what God told Abraham is that after 400 years, I'll bring them out. What God didn't tell Abraham was that he will prepare sustenance for them in that land. And they will multiply. And they will be exceedingly a great people. To the extent that their host nation will become afraid of them. They must have read the book somewhere. So when they got into Egypt, they continued to marry. They continued to have children. They continued to give children out in marriage. They continued to take wives in marriage for their sons. They kept growing. They kept living because they knew that they were not dead. It's only today's Christian that is graced with the privilege of a submarine moment and calls up and says, kill me. If you killed me, it would have been better than this. That's what we say. But I wonder, can't God trust you again? <laughs> you didn't get it. Because it's only those that God trusts that he will lock up like that. Why can't God trust you again? Why are you quarreling? What was supposed to be a privilege? To, to be a privilege? Why are you quarreling with it? Why can you not embrace the fact that the God of heaven, of all the people in the earth, saw you and he knew you were the one that would continue to be light in the darkest of places? Why? Why can you not let God trust you? 
every step of the way, Joseph was standing. He listened. He made friends. He planned for a future he didn't know if he had. He shone light on things that people would never have found solutions to. Because why many of us saw the, see the submarine as a curse? Why many of us see the submarine as an affliction of the devil? <laughs> Joseph saw the submarine as a badge of honor. What should I do if I'm in the form, if, if I find myself in a submarine? Joseph is the former runner. We can see it. Even before Jeremiah was written, Joseph lived it. So no wonder when in Jeremiah, God started to tell prophet Jeremiah to go and tell the elders and the priests and the people who were, and the prophets who were in captivity. It was not a hard task for Jeremiah. You know why? Because he knew it was possible. People have lived it before. He, Jeremiah, in that time was living his version of it. If you find yourself in a submarine where treasures of darkness are being mined, trust God. If you go with me to Isaiah chapter number 50, Isaiah 50 verse number 10. I'm rounding off now. Isaiah 50 number 10. It says in verse 10, it says, Who, am who is among you who reverently fears the Lord? Who obeys the voice of his servant? Yet who walks in darkness and deep trouble and has no shining splendor in his heart? Let him rely on trusting and be confident in the name of the Lord. And let him lean upon and be supported by his God. If you fear the Lord and you suddenly find yourself in a place of darkness or deep trouble, or as we called it today, the submarine, you need to remember that the one who led you there, he's your father. He's not your enemy. The best posture is the posture of trust. We must trust him. If you go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16 to 18, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 16 to 18. It says, Therefore, we do not become discouraged, utterly spiritless, exhausted, and wearied out, of, out through fear. Though our outer man is progressively decaying and wasting away, yet our inner self is being progressively renewed day by day. For our light momentary affliction, this light distress of the passing hour, is ever more and more abundantly preparing and producing and achieving for us an everlasting weight of glory beyond all measure, excessively surpassing all comparisons and all calculations, a vast and transcendent glory and blessedness never to cease. Verse 18 says, since we consider and do not look to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are visible are temporal, brief and fleeting. But the things that are invisible are deathless and everlasting. You need to recognize that when you find yourself locked in. Just because you, it seems to you like you have countless nights in, rolling into light. Does not mean that there is no morning outside. There is no afternoon outside and there is no evening outside. And what it means is that one day, because those days still exist, day and night still exist, your time would be up and you will find your way out. Yeah. Hallelujah. So when you find yourself in a submarine, posture for inner renewal, that's what Second Corinthians chapter 4 is saying. In, 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 in Daniel chapter 2 verse 22, when you find yourself in a submarine, posture for hidden, hidden and deep and hidden things or revelation. Daniel chapter 2 verse number 22. Daniel 2 22. 
It says he reveals the deep and secret things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells in him. When you find yourself there rather than fret, adopt the attitude of, Lord, I'm here. My pen is ready. My paper is ready. Speak, Lord, your servant. Listen it. The fourth thing you can do if you find yourself in a submarine is taken from Isaiah 45, verse 19. Isaiah 45, verse number 19. Isaiah 45, 19 says, I have not spoken in secret in a corner of the land of darkness. I did not call the descendants of Jacob to fruitless service, saying, seek me for nothing. But I promised them a just reward. I, the Lord, speak righteousness. The truth, trustworthy, straightforward correspondence between deeds and words. I declare things that are right. When you get in the submarine, don't forget, God will reward you. Every time you go through that moment, I can promise you that as sure as tomorrow is Monday, you are always better when you come out than when you went in. Finally, if you find yourself in a submarine, even in darkness, his light will shine in you. He will not abandon you. I know that. If you go with me to Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 verse number 16. Isaiah 42 verse number 16. It says, and I will bring the blind by a way that they know not. I will lead them in, the, in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness into light before them and make uneven places into a plain. These things I have determined to do for them, for I will not leave them forsaken. My brothers and sisters, there is nowhere in the world where is mountain top, where the topography is mountain top only. And there is nowhere in the world where it is valleys only. It's a blend of all of this. And we need to get to that point. It's the point of maturity. It's the point of sonship. To arrive at that place where we are clear. That no matter what God would enlist us in, we will be fine. But today is not just about being fine. Is about having the right attitude while you are there. Just because you found yourself in a submarine does not, um, what's the word, release you from the duties of a soldier. Honor is the key in a submarine moment. The code is honor. To remember that the God, the God of heaven, it is he who has brought you in here. You must honor him. Even if you don't understand what he's doing. Your attitude must be and my attitude must be the right one. We must live like we know we have life in us. And not that we are dead. It is what God expects of us. And it is how we make our callings and our election sure. Again, like I said to us last week. This is not prophetic to say, oh, submarine is coming at you. Because to be truthful... Most of us are inside submarine right now. Am I correct? My version may not be your version. Yours may, in your mind may be, not as, may be darker than my own. But you can't take away the fact that none of us is living life at the level that we could live it in God yet. And let it not be that it's because we have not done our best in our posture and attitude. That in another two years we will still be here. Let it be said that at the end of the day, God will look at us and say, "Seest thou a man?" <laughs> ah, God will look at you and say, "Have you considered my servant?" Because He just knows that no matter what happens, you and me, we will build houses. <laughs> 
we will plant gardens. We will marry. We will have children. We will give our children out in marriage. We would marry for our sons. We will encourage them to have children. We will multiply. We will not be diminished even though we are in a submarine. Because even in darkness, the Lord can increase us. Even in darkness, the Lord is calling us to enlarge the place of our tent. He says, just because you are going through does not mean that you have, I have given up on you. I will bring you back again. But when you come back, you better have war stories to tell. You better be able to tell me of what you built. You better be able to tell me of how your light affected the lights of others. You better have something to show for your time in the submarine. If you're on this broadcast this evening or this afternoon and you're yet to give your life to Jesus, I would encourage you the grace to do well in a submarine and not be claustrophobic and begin to climb walls is found in the light that dwells on the inside of us. Our Lord is a good God. And no matter what he lets us go to come to, he has us covered. Father Lord, if you are out there and you want to give your life to Jesus, I want you to say, Lord Jesus, I give you my life. My Father and my God, I honor and I worship you. Thank you for your sons and your daughters. Thank you for what you have done today. Thank you for your words that will not stand against us. Father Lord, we yield, O oh God, to your leading. Father Lord, that we will have the right posture. And Lord, we will live and continue to live. Unless we are dead, we will not act like we are dead. In the name of Jesus. Father, we worship you. And we give you all the praise. I am relevant even in the submarine. Say it. I am relevant. I am relevant even in the submarine. Father, look at you here. Father, I am relevant even in the submarine. I am not dead.